Section forty three of the Mysteries of London, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume three, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section forty three. Chapter forty two. The Paragraph in the Newspaper having partaken of a good dinner and imbibed a glass or two of wine tom rain returned to the perusal of the sunday newspaper which it brought with him to his old lodgings for the highwayman loved a newspaper dearly especially the police reports and old bailey trials but as his eye glanced down a column principally devoted to fashionable intelligence he was struck with a mingled horror and astonishment by the ensuing announcement it is rumoured that the young and wealthy Earl of Ellingham will shortly lead to the hymeneal altar the beautiful and accomplished Lady Hatfield. Her ladyship is a peeress in her own right, that distinction having been conferred upon her in consequence of the eminent services of her ladyship's deceased father. Tom Rain was absolutely stupefied by this paragraph, so stupefied indeed that he sat gazing upon it in a species of vacant wonderment, not starting nor uttering any ejaculation, so that neither the Jewess nor Charlie Watts, who were both in the room, noticed his emotion. At length he recovered himself and read and re-read the paragraph until he could have repeated it by heart. The shades of evening were gathering fast over this hemisphere, and he had therefore now a good excuse for going out, for that announcement in the Sunday paper had produced such an effect upon him that he felt he could not rest until he had performed a duty, an imperious but most painful duty. Having hastily arranged his toilet in the bedroom upstairs, and put on a dark upper coat and a large woollen comforter, he sallied forth but not without having previously kissed both the jewess and little charlie at the nearest coach station he entered a hack vehicle and ordered the driver to take him to the residence of lady hatfield in piccadilly but ere the coach arrived quite opposite the front door of the fair patrician's abode rainford alighted and dismissed the vehicle then he advanced to the house but it was with the step of a man who would rather oh a thousand times rather have fled in any other direction his hand was on the knocker and he hesitated yes he hesitated and that hand trembled it must have been some powerful cause that could have made the gallant dauntless almost hare-brained tom rain manifest so much emotion but at length the summons was given and a livery servant opened the door to Rainford's inquiry whether Lady Hatfield were at home, an affirmative answer was given. "'Say to your mistress,' returned the highwayman, "'that a person wishes to speak to her upon very particular business, "'and do me the favour to show me to a room where I can see her ladyship alone.' The servant hesitated a moment, for the excited tone in which the request was made somewhat surprised him. But remembering that it was not his business to question his lady's visitors, he conducted Rainford into a parlour where a fire was burning in the grate, and, having lighted the candles, the domestic retired to deliver to Lady Hatfield the message which he had received. The few minutes which elapsed ere the door of that room again opened seemed like an age to Tom Rain. He first sat down, then he rose again and stood before the fire in a state of extraordinary nervousness. In fact, he appeared perfectly unmanned. We can conceive the feelings of appalling doubt, hope mingled with terrific fear, and agonizing suspense that must be experienced by an individual accused of a capital crime and awaiting in the dock the return of the jury in whose hands are his life and death. Such was the state of Tom Rain during the five mortal minutes that elapsed before the door opened again. At length it did open and though he had his back turned towards it, yet the rustling of silk and a light, airy tread convinced him that the lady of the house was now in that room. He turned. The light streamed full upon his countenance, for he had laid aside his hat and woolen comforter, and Lady Hatfield, for it was she, uttered a faint scream, 
as her eyes met his pardon this intrusion fear me not now my lady exclaimed rainsford hastily but grant me five minutes attention i implore you not for my sake for yours georgiana had started back and had become pale as death when she recognised the highwayman but even while he was yet speaking she recovered herself sufficiently to approach the spot where he was standing then without sitting down but leaning her arm upon the mantelpiece as if for support she said in a hoarse and hollow tone my god what would you with me lady hatfield returned rainford in a mournful and even solemn tone forget the past if you can for a few minutes forget the past repealed georgiana hysterically her whole frame convulsed with horror oh terrible man wherefore have you come hither have you not injured me enough what do you now seek my life and as she uttered these last words the syllables seemed to hiss between her set teeth and her bosom heaved and fell rapidly with spasmodic palpitation listen to me madam i implore you exclaimed rainford cruelly perplexed and deeply touched by the agonizing emotions which his presence occasioned i know that the sight of me must be abhorrent loathsome to you but it will be your fault if our interview is protracted beyond the few minutes which i ask you to grant me speak sir speak quickly cried georgiana hysterically but mark me sir she added in a firmer and more resolute tone while her usually placid glances seemed to glare with deadly hatred against the highwayman mark me she repeated if your intention be to coerce me again to commit a crime for your sake you will not succeed but a few days have elapsed since the stain of perjury rank abhorrent perjury was fastened on my soul and to save you oh that i could have been so weak as to yield to your insolent command to swear to that which was false atrociously vilely false at the bar of justice and now proceed sir with the business which has brought you hither lady hatfield i cannot i dare not explain myself while you labour under this dreadful excitement said rainford himself painfully excited calm yourself i implore you for what i have to say most nearly concerns your interests my interests repeated georgiana in a sorrowful voice but proceed go on sir i will be calm i observed in a newspaper of this day's date continued rainford that your ladyship is about to become the wife of the earl of ellingham lady hatfield gazed upon the highwayman in that vacant manner which left it doubtful whether she were the prey to feelings of surprise terror or despair and if that rumour be true my lady added rainford after a moment's pause i would have you reflect on the propriety of this matrimonial connection my god he assumes the right to dictate to me almost shrieked georgiana as she sank back upon the sofa clasping her hands together in the excess of her mental anguish no my lady not to dictate said rainford i have not a shadow of a right to do that if it were the height of madness the height of presumption an insolence beyond all parallel on my part in fact a deed so monstrously inconsistent with even common sense that you are surprised i should have entertained the idea asked georgiana with an irony and bitterness which seemed lent her by despair my god i foresaw all the terrors of this interview exclaimed rainford with feverish impatience then wherefore did you come demanded georgiana is it to expose me to persecute me who have never offended you but who have suffered so deeply deeply madam i came to perform a painful duty interrupted the highwayman and the sooner i accomplish it the better oh you know not you will not give me credit for the ineffable pity the profound commiseration which i feel for you as well as the loathing the abhorrence the shame the disgust in which i hold myself but i cannot recall the past would to god that i could then you mean me no harm exclaimed georgiana eagerly 
mean you harm madam repeated rainford enthusiastically merciful heavens if to mitigate one single pang of the many many which your breast must throb poor innocent sufferer that you are a sufferer through my detestable crime if to relieve you of any portion of the load that waits upon your mind were that portion no heavier than a hair if to do this my life would suffice i would lay it down madam at your feet think you that i glory in what i have done no no bad as i am criminal as i am robber plunderer as i am and as you know me to be yet i have feelings ay and a conscience too and often often my lady when the smile is upon my lip that conscience is gnawing my heart's core for i think of you and all this is true as god's own justice is true true as that you are an innocent and a noble lady and i am a despicable villain and tom rain the gallant dashing almost hare-brained tom rain burst into tears georgiana gazed upon him in astonishment in profound astonishment and she was softened towards that bold and desperate man who wept on her account but wherefore have you sought me this evening she said in a milder and more gentle tone than she had used during this remarkable this solemnly interesting meeting it is not to demand your pardon madam returned rainford dashing away the tears from his manly countenance because that you can never give it is not to assert any presumed right to dictate to you in respect to your marriage because that were adding the most flagrant cruelty to the most atrocious wrong but it is to inform your ladyship that if you contract this marriage with the earl of ellingham you wed one who is who is what gasped georgiana almost suffocating rainford paused for a few moments it required these few moments to enable him to conquer emotions of so terrible a nature that they almost choked his powers of utterance and then bending down until his very lips touched georgiana's ear and his hair mingled with hers he whispered a few words in a faint and scarcely audible tone but she heard them plainly ah far too plainly and when he withdrew his face from its proximity to her head and glanced upon her countenance he saw with feelings awfully shocked that she sat mute motionless the image of despair alas she spoke not she looked neither to the right nor to the left her eyes seemed to be fixed upon the face of the highwayman and yet she saw him not she was gazing on vacancy this dreadful state of stupefaction the paralysis of despair lasted for upwards of three minutes a perfect age alike to her who endured and to him who beheld it and then suddenly burst from lady hatfield's lips a long loud piercing scream a scream so appalling that the very house appeared to shake with the vibration of the air which was cut by that shriek as by a keen-edged sword merciful god the whole place will be alarmed ejaculated the highwayman compose yourself madam but vainly did he thus address himself to the unhappy georgiana she had fallen back insensible upon the sofa the door opened abruptly but tom rain was rooted to the spot where he stood gazing on the motionless form of that wretched lady stood gazing too in horrified amazement at the effect which his whispered words had produced the scream to which lady hatfield had given vent in the paroxysm of her ineffable anguish had reached the ears not only of the domestics in the kitchen but also of the company in the drawing-room for there were guests that evening at georgiana's residence thus when the door burst open a crowd of persons poured in lord ellingham dr lassells sir ralph walsingham three or four ladies and all the servants miss mordaunt we should observe was no longer an inmate of lady hatfield's abode for reasons that will be explained hereafter lord ellingham was the foremost of the crowd and the first object that met his eyes as he rushed into the room was his georgiana stretched senseless on the sofa he saw a man standing near but he didn't pause to cast a second glance upon him the state in which he found his beloved engrossed all his thoughts 
He raised her in his arms. The ladies produced their smelling bottles. The female servants hastened to fetch water, vinegar, and anything else that struck them as useful under the circumstances. And Dr. Lassells, who had recognised Tom Rain, though without appearing to do so, professionally superintended all the means resorted to for the purpose of restoring suspended animation, while the highwayman still looked on with a kind of mechanical attention. At length Georgiana opened her eyes slowly, but the moment they caught a glimpse of Lord Ellingham's countenance, a faint cry escaped her lips, and she covered her face with her hands, as if to shut out some terrible object from her view. "'Georgiana, dearest, tis I!' murmured Arthur in her ear, but her dreadful shudder seemed to convulse her entire frame. "'Someone has terrified her, alarmed her!' exclaimed the Earl, colouring with anger, as he glanced rapidly around. His eyes met those of the highwayman. At that moment Dr. Lassells desired that Lady Hatfield should be supported to her chamber, and this suggestion was immediately followed by the female friends and the servants, the physician accompanying them. End of section 43 Recording by Gray Clayton Section 44 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 44. Chapter 43. Lord Ellingham and Tom Rainford. Lord Ellingham and Sir Ralph Walsingham remained behind in the apartment where Rainford also still was. Sir, said the nobleman, advancing towards the high woman, you will perhaps be kind enough to explain the cause of her ladyship's emotion. For the scream which reached our ears and the condition in which we found her denotes something more serious than sudden indisposition. This gentleman, sir, added the earl, indicating Sir Ralph Walsingham with a glance, is Lady Hatfield's uncle. You therefore need not hesitate to address yourself to him, even should you decline to vouchsafe an explanation to me, who am a total stranger to you. Yes, my lord, for I know you well by sight. We are total strangers to each other, replied Rainford in a singularly mournful tone, and yet... But he stopped short, seized his hat, and was about to hasten from the room, when the Earl caught him somewhat rudely by the arm, saying, Mr. Rainford, for such I believe to be your name, we cannot part with you thus. A lady, dear, very dear to me, and who indeed will shortly be my wife, dear also to Sir Ralph Walsingham, who is now present, that lady has been alarmed, terrified in some manner, by you, and we must insist upon an explanation. My lord, returned Tom Rain in a tone of deep emotion as he gazed with a peculiar, almost scrutinising attention upon the earl's countenance. No other man on earth would thus have dared to stop me with impunity. As for explanations, he continued, his voice suddenly assuming a little of its usual reckless indifference, I have none to give. And again he moved towards the door. But Lord Ellingham hastened to place his back against it in a determined manner, while Rainford, as if discouraged and daunted, fell back a few paces. Mr. Rainford, exclaimed the Earl, this matter cannot pass off thus. I insist upon an explanation, or I shall consider it to be my duty to detain you until Lady Hatfield be sufficiently recovered to declare the nature of the treatment she has experienced at your hands. Moreover, sir, added the nobleman, observing that, Rainford's lip blanched and quivered nervously. You are to a certain degree an object of suspicion in my eyes. A variety of circumstances have combined to prove to me that you were implicated to some degree in the theft of diamonds, which lately caused so much embarrassment at the police court. My lord, that business does not regard you, replied the highwayman. The diamonds were restored to their lawful owner, and more than that, I even ascertained from Mr. Gordon's own lips that they were paid for before their restoration by one who... But let me depart, my lord, I say, ejaculated Tom, his manner suddenly changing from nervous trepidation 
to the excitement of impatience. You must remain here, sir, said Arthur coldly, until we ascertain whether it be Lady Hatfield's pleasure that your detention should assume a more serious aspect. Allow me to pass, my dear Earl, exclaimed Sir Ralph, and I will hasten to ascertain how my niece is now, and what her intentions are with respect to this person. Rainford paced the room in an agitated manner, while Lord Ellingham afforded egress to the baronet, and then resumed his position of sentinel with his back placed against the door. My lord, at length said the highwayman, advancing close up to the earl and speaking in a low, oppressed tone, you will find that her ladyship has no complaint to make against me. Permit me to take my departure, and again I tell you that no other living soul would I solicit as a favour what I would command by force. I cannot allow you to leave this room, at least until the return of Sir Ralph Walsingham, answered the earl. Lady Hatfield must have been insulted or menaced by you in some way. I take God to witness that I neither insulted nor menaced her, interrupted Rainford warmly. If your liberty be endangered, said the nobleman, it is well worth a falsehood to attempt to avert the peril. My God, this from him, muttered Rainford bitterly to himself as he once more turned around to pace the room. And then, at the expiration of a minute, he said in a calmer tone, Well, my lord, I am content to wait until the decision of her ladyship is made known in respect to me. And since it appears that we shall have a few moments more of each other's society, permit me to ask, your lordship having just now alluded to a certain transaction at a police court, permit me to ask, I say, whether you really believe that Miss Esther de Medina was innocent or guilty of the charge imputed to her? This is rather a singular question coming from you, Mr. Rainford, exclaimed the Earl. And before I answer it, allow me to ask whether it was not you who left a certain letter at my house, desiring me to repair to the police office on that occasion. I will not deny the fact, my lord, replied Rainford. Indeed, I did not particularly study concealment respecting it. Else would I not have afforded your lordship's servants an opportunity of describing to you the personal appearance of the individual who left that letter. But if your lordship entertains even the shadow of a suspicion injurious to the character of Mr. Medina, you are wrong. You are in error. Yes, as grievously in error as ever mistaken man could be. Beside my lord, added Rainford hastily, you are well aware that the alibi which your lordship proved was correct. And how knew you that Mr. Medina was with her father and myself at Finchley on the very day and at the very hour? when the diamonds were alleged to have been taken, demanded the Earl. It will be useless to pretend that accident gave me the information, answered Tom Rain. But think not that she employed me as an agent or as a messenger to obtain the intervention of your lordship. Mr. Rainford, said the Earl haughtily, I dislike the present conversation. I have the highest opinion of Mr. de Medina, and I shall be sorry to think ill of any one connected with him. But I must candidly confess that there is so much mystery respecting the character of his daughter, a mystery too existing on account of yourself. For which reason alone do I condescend to discuss with you any affair relating to Mr. de Medina or his family? Lord Ellingham interrupted Rainford in a hasty and impetuous tone. Esther de Medina is the very personification of innocence and virtue. As God is my judge, she was ignorant of my interference in her behalf on that day when she was accused of a deed from which her pure soul would recoil with horror. She knew not even that I was in the court. And yet you were there, Mr. Rainford, exclaimed the Earl, for I noticed you, although at the time I knew not who you were. But Mr. Medina was not aware of my presence, rejoined Rainford emphatically, for she does not know me by sight. A smile of incredulity curled the nobleman's lips, but the oath which Mr. de Medina had administered to his daughter, and in which her connection with Rainford was so emphatically mentioned, was uppermost in his mind, but he dare not allude to that circumstance, though he would have been truly rejoiced to receive the conviction 
that esther was indeed far different from what he was at present compelled to believe her to be your lordship said ere now resumed tom rain that you noticed me in the court although at the time you knew not who i was those were your words does your lordship now know who i am i cannot boast of a very intimate acquaintance with you or your affairs mr rainford returned the nobleman with an auteur bordering on contempt and what i do know of you is so little in your favour that you see i am detaining you here on the suspicion that your visit to lady hatfield was for no good purpose in fact the first i ever heard of you was in reference to the charge on account of which you yourself figured at bow street some short time since a charge of which i am bound to say you were honourably acquitted lady hatfield having satisfactorily proved that you are not the person who robbed her on the highway thus far my lord said rainford you have no just ground to speak disparagingly of my character certainly not but then comes the affair of the diamonds and i do not hesitate to inform you that mr gordon related to me all the particulars of your interview with him when you called to restore the jewels and when he made you aware of the fact that mr medina had already been to pay him the full value thereof ah mr gordon was thus communicative observed Greenwood. yes and not sparing of his aspersions against the character of mr medina returned the earl but i defended her mr rainford i defended her then and wherefore should you not defend her now my lord demanded the highwayman oh were i to reveal to you by what wondrous combination of circumstances but no i dare not and yet my lord he added in an earnest solemn tone you are an upright a generous-hearted man and i appeal to your good feelings i implore you not to trust to outward appearances as there is a god above esther de medina is innocent of everything anything that scandal or misconception may have imputed to her again you smile incredulously and yet mournfully my lord ah i can assure you that esther is innocent oh believe her to be innocent at this moment footsteps were heard approaching the door which lord Enningham accordingly opened and sir ralph walsingham reappeared how is georgiana now inquired the nobleman hastily my niece is ill very ill returned the baronet ill ejaculated arthur ah villain this is your work he cried rushing towards the highwayman keep off thundered rainford you know not whom you would strike no touch him not cried sir ralph catching the earl by the arm and holding him back i have seen my niece dr lassells is now alone with her she is more composed though very far from well and she begs that this person be allowed to depart without the slightest molestation her ladyship shall be obeyed sir ralph returned the nobleman mr rainford you have heard the message that has been sent relative to yourself having thus spoken arthur turned aside for a strange misgiving a vague suspicion no not a suspicion either but a vague feeling of dissatisfaction had stolen into his mind if rainford had alarmed or insulted lady hatfield wherefore should she allow him to go unpunished was it not more probable that he had brought her some evil tidings but how could there exist any connection however remote or slight between that man of equivocal character and georgiana hatfield what business could possibly bring them together and produce so strange so powerful an impression upon her all these ideas rushed to the earl's mind in rapid and bewildering succession and the reader need not be astonished if we repeat that a sentiment of dissatisfaction almost amounting to a vague suspicion but of what he knew not had suddenly taken a firm hold of his imagination who was this rainford after all was he other than he seemed could he be in any way connected with that narrative of the black mask which the earl supposed to have partially affected his georgiana's mind and which he looked upon as the cause of that apparent fickleness or caprice which had first led her to refuse his proffered hand 
the more he involved himself in conjecture the deeper did he plunge into a labyrinth which grew darker and more bewildering at every step but he turned around again towards the place where he had left rainford standing that individual was gone and the nobleman was alone with sir ralph walsingham you have seen georgiana said arthur advancing towards the baronet and grasping his hand with a convulsive violence of deep emotion i have my dear earl and she appears as if she had received some severe shock was the reply what in the name of god does all this mean exclaimed the nobleman with wildness in his tone i know not i cannot comprehend it answered the uncle as much bewildered as the lover but did you not question your niece did she offer no explanation did she not state the cause of her emotion that piercing scream that fainting that movement of horror when she recovered demanded the earl impatiently i questioned her but perceiving that it only augmented her agitation i did not press a painful interrogatory replied sir ralph when i informed her that you had detained that man who i heard you address by the name of rainford and whom i therefore supposed to have been the person suspected of robbing my niece when i informed her that you had detained him i say she was greatly excited and desired me to hasten and request you to allow him to depart immediately as she had no cause of complaint against him strange most strange murmured the earl have patience my dear arthur said sir ralph to-morrow georgiana will be better and then she will doubtless explain to-morrow to-morrow repeated the nobleman impatiently oh what suspense what terrible suspense ah sir ralph you do not know how wretchedly will pass the weary hours of this night if i could but see her only for a moment would you be indiscreet dear sir ralph have pity on me and ask lassels to come and speak with me the baronet who was a kind-hearted man instantly departed to execute this commission and in a few minutes he returned accompanied by the physician to the latter the earl repeated the same question which he had already addressed to sir ralph walsingham what in the name of god does all this mean and the doctor gave almost a similar reply i know not i cannot understand it but there was less sincerity in this answer as given by lassels than there was in the same response as uttered from the heart by the frank and honest baronet for the physician had his suspicions relative to the mysterious connection which now appeared to subsist between lady hatfield and the individual whose visit had caused so much painful excitement that villain rainford i am sorry even now that i suffered him to escape ejaculated the earl scarcely knowing how to act or speak rainford cried the physician why that is the name of the man who was taken up on suspicion of having robbed her ladyship near hounslow and that was thomas rainford who was here ere now returned arthur with bitter emphasis as if he hated the name rainford exclaimed the physician in astonishment i thought that man's name was jameson the reader will remember that such was the denomination under which the highwayman passed when residing in south Moulton street what do you know him demanded the earl gazing upon the doctor with unfeigned surprise i once attended a patient at his abode was the laconic reply for the cells remember the solemn promise which he had made to tom rain on that occasion and where did he live inquired arthur eagerly i may wish to see that man again where he lived then he does not live now returned the physician for he moved away the very next day after i was called in and whither he went to the people of the house knew not i believe him to be a man of bad character observed arthur hastily but enough of him at least for the present doctor can i be permitted to see lady hatfield for a few minutes impossible for to-night my dear earl replied the physician her ladyship is in a state of nervous agitation feverish excitement indeed and must not be disturbed her maids are now with her and she is about to retire to rest to-morrow my dear ellingham you shall see her that is provided she is more composed then must i submit to this weary night of suspense exclaimed the young nobleman but to-morrow doctor i may see her 
you have promised me that i shall see her to-morrow my visit will be somewhat early will it be indiscreet if i call at eleven call at eleven then returned the physician smiling at his friend's impatience but i think i ought to administer a composing draught to you the earl and sir ralph walsingham shook hands with dr lascelles and took their departure the other guests had already gone but the physician remained behind to see his fair patient once more ere he returned home when lascelles found himself alone in the apartment which the young nobleman and the baronet had just left he fell into a train of reflection which like the earl's state of mind was strangely characterized by perplexity where the doctor's thoughts put into words they would assume as nearly as possible the ensuing shape well this is an evening of unpleasant adventure that jameson or rainford or whatever his name is has brought confusion and dismay into the house perplexities increase rapidly i remember all that ellingham said to me the day that he called to inform me that he was the happiest of men and that her ladyship had accepted him he declared then that he knew all that he would never allow what must be considered a misfortune to stand in the way of his happiness and so on i also remember complimenting him on his moral courage in rising superior to a common prejudice and then we dropped the conversation because we agreed that it was a delicate subject and so it was too a devilish delicate subject and i had found out the grand secret by stealth ah the effects of that opiate were powerful and she never suspected that i did find out the secret but ellingham scarcely seems to have his wits about him or else he must suspect the object of this rainford's visit it's as clear as daylight rainford is the man and now he wants to extort money from her ladyship but ellingham cannot put two and two together as i can and the physician rubbed his hands complacently little suspecting that his sapient conjecture relative to the object of the highwayman's visit was totally wrong as the reader is aware this rainford is an extraordinary character and i do believe that he really robbed her ladyship but that she did not dare say so in the police court he has the cut of a dashing fellow who would as soon rifle a pocket as drink a bumper of wine curse him for having intruded on the mysteries of my laboratory oh if ellingham only knew what i know about the beautiful esther de medina the charming jewess what deceivers some women are to look on esther one would think she was purity itself and yet the physician's reverie was interrupted by the entrance of a female servant who came to inform him that lady hatfield had retired to her bed and that the doctor might now visit her again he accordingly repaired to her chamber and having prescribed some composing medicine took his departure without once alluding to the incidents of the evening for he was anxious that georgiana's mind should remain as free from causes of excitement and agitation as possible end of section forty four recording by greg clayton section forty five of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gray clayton the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section forty five chapter forty four mr frank curtis again in the meantime thomas rainford had quitted the abode of lady hatfield with a heavy heart for the duty which he had felt himself called upon to perform in making a particular statement to georgiana had pained acutely pained his generous soul he had not proceeded many yards from that lady's dwelling when he suddenly encountered mr frank curtis and as at that precise moment the glare of a lamp streamed full upon rainford's countenance he was immediately recognized by that impertinent young gentleman ah captain sparks ejaculated frank so we meet again do we well it's very fortunate that i did not accept my friend the duke's invitation to his select dinner-party or else i should have missed this pleasure 
now what is to prevent me from collaring you my fine fellow and raising a hue and cry fear mr curtis fear will prevent you returned tom rain recovering all his wonted presence of mind and taking the young man's arm he said walk a little way with me i want to have a few minutes chat with you here put your hand on my great coat pocket that's right now you can feel a pistol inside eh well its companion is in the other pocket and you must know enough of me already to be fully aware that any treachery on your part would meet with its reward for i would shoot you in the open street if you attempted to place my liberty in danger i'm sure i i, I don't want to injure you captain sparks stammered frank trembling from head to foot as he walked along arm in arm with the highwayman i always took you for a capital fellow and i should very much like to drink a bottle of wine with you what do you say shall we go into the gloucester or hatchets neither one nor the other mr curtis interrupted rainford i thank you for your civility all the same oh it's nothing captain i learnt politeness in france where to be sure i had excellent i may say peculiar advantages the king was very much attached to me and as for the ladies of the court oh don't ask me to speak about them captain sparks indeed i will not returned tom dryly i want you to let me know how your uncle gets on does he still remember that pleasant little adventure ha ha and the highwayman's merry laugh donated that his spirits were reviving once more sir christopher oh the old fool don't talk to me about him ejaculated frank curtis i've done with my uncle i shall cut him i can never speak of him again captain sparks he has disgraced himself disgraced his family which was a very ancient one i always thought sir christopher made a boast of having risen from nothing said tom ironically ah so he did but that was only part of his system of gammoning people continued frank his family was originally the celebrated blondevilles of france about three thousand years ago they settled in scotland and their name was corrupted to blundevit and then a branch came to england about fifteen hundred years ago and in process of time they spelt their name with a t blundeville at last the e was left out and it became bluntvit and god only knows why but three hundred and seventy seven years ago come next michaelmas the vill was dropped and the name settled down into a simple blunt so you see captain that sir christopher is of a good family after all why don't you try and get a situation in the herald's college demanded rainford you'd be able to find pedigrees for all the browns jones thompsons and smiths in the country come come captain sparks exclaimed frank this observation isn't fair on your part i may have my faults i know i have but don't shoot with the long bow i hate that kind of thing but let us return to the subject of your uncle sir christopher said tom what's he been doing run away with a lady's maid gone to gretna with lady hatfield's female servant charlotte cried frank with great bitterness of tone the damned old fool but i'll cut him cut him dead and that's some consolation gone to gretna with lady hatfield's maid exclaimed rainford maid indeed i hope he'll find her so said curtis the hussy but i'll be even with her yet and when did this happen inquired tom ah only a few days ago they're not come back yet i dare say sir christopher already repents his bargain but i'll cut him i'm afraid if you cut his acquaintance he'll cut off your supplies observed rainford jocosely but what does that matter ejaculated frank do you think there are no rich women in london that will be glad to have a decent-looking fellow like myself gad i've already got introduced to a widow as wealthy as if her late husband had been a nabob it's true that she's blessed with five pledges of the said late husband's affection but when she's got five thousand a year and one five is a good set off against the other captain sparks rather so eh old fellow well i think it is returned the highwayman but how did all this happen about sir christopher and the lady's maid i'll tell you answered curtis you see sir christopher was going to run away with miss mordaunt lady hatfield's friend and i found it out in one of my clever ways so i resolved to balk sir christopher and i bribed this lady's maid charlotte in fact i gave her five hundred pounds and a gold watch the hussy 
to go to the appointment get into the carriage personate miss julia mordaunt and keep up the farce until they got to st albans where me and a parcel of my friends were to be at the inn to receive them that was to be the joke and how did the joke turn so completely against yourself asked tom why me and my friends waited and waited and waited at the infernal hotel at st albans and no sir christopher no charlotte came we had a glorious supper and made a regular night of it all next day we waited and waited again but no sir christopher no charlotte what the devil can this mean thought i to myself so i came up to london leaving my friends at the inn in st albans in pawn for the bill for somehow or another none of us had enough money about us to settle it but when i came back to town i went home that is you know to my uncle's house in jermyn street and there i found a letter that had just come for me by the post it was written from some town a good way north and it was from sir christopher i began to think something was wrong and sure enough there was for when i opened the letter i found that my silly old uncle had written to thank me for throwing in his way a delightful and most amiable woman who had consented to take his name and share his fortune the letter went on to say that they were then pretty far on the road to gretna and that as they should stop at st albans as they came back i might be there if i choose to have the pleasure of handing my aunt out of the carriage that was all said to irritate me you know captain sparks and most likely that vixen charlotte made sir christopher write the letter just to annoy me but i'll cut them both dead and we shall see what my precious aunt for such she is by this time i suppose will say then this is really a very pleasant little adventure cried tom rain but i think you carried your joke too far mr curtis and so it has recoiled upon yourself have you seen mr torrens lately not i exclaimed curtis but don't you confess captain that you carried matters a trifle too far that night never mind the two thousand pounds i'm glad my old hunks of an uncle lost that but i allude to the affair of helping the gals to run away i suppose you were in league with villiers all the time what makes you think that villiers had anything to do with the matter inquired rainford simply because i don't imagine you carried off the gals for your own sake however continued frank i care but little about the matter now i certainly liked adelais very much at the time but there are plenty of others in the world quite as handsome besides i now see through all sir christopher's trickery in wanting me to marry miss torrance in such a deuce of a hurry and in giving me a separate establishment the old bird wanted to commit matrimony himself and i should have been poked off with a few paltry hundreds a year and so you will now said tom or matters may be even worse after the trick you endeavoured to play upon your uncle not a bit of it cried tom had old blunt's scheme succeeded i should have been married to a portionless gal and forced to live on whatever he chose to give me now that his project has failed i am free and unshackled and can secure myself a position by marriage i might even look as high as my friend the duke's niece but she is horribly ill-tempered and so i think of making an offer of my heart and hand i can do the thing well if i like you know captain to mrs goldbury the widow i spoke of just now the name sounds well i confess observed tom but did your uncle never i mean did he not instruct his lawyer to adopt any proceedings about that little affair of the two thousand pounds not he captain exclaimed frank curtis as far as my uncle is concerned you may rest quite satisfied that he will never take any notice of the business and howard wouldn't act without his instructions they had now reached charing cross and tom rain having had quite enough of mr curtis's company signified his desire that they should separate you won't pass an hour with me over a bottle of wine said the young man i really should like to have a chat with such a gallant dashing fellow as you are captain for you're quite after my own heart barring the the highway business eh cried tom laughing why you cannot for a minute suppose that it is my regular profession mr curtis no such a thing i merely eased you of the two thousand pounds for the joke of it just as you played off your tricks on sir christopher you talk about easing me captain returned frank but i can assure you that you're the first man that ever got the better of me 
don't fancy for a moment that i-i'm a coward captain sparks far from it my dear sir exclaimed tom i know you to be as brave as you are straightforward in your conversation so good-night and pray take care not to follow me for i've an awkward habit of turning round and knocking on the head any one that i imagine to be watching me with these words the highwayman hurried off up the strand and frank curtis entered a cigar shop muttering to himself damn the fellow i almost think he melt that for insolence egad if he did the next time i meet him but the valiant young gentleman did not precisely make up his mind what he should do in the case supposed and any resentment which he experienced speedily evaporated with the soothing influence of a cheroot meantime tom rain pursued his way along the strand and fleet street and repaired to the lodgings of mr clarence villiers in bridge street that gentleman was at home and received his visitor in a very friendly manner you are most welcome captain sparks he said and the more so if you intend to pass an hour or two with me for my aunt is so very particular that she would take the girls to church with her this evening but of course i did not offer to accompany them as i could not wear a veil over my face you know he added laughing and were i recognised by mr torrens or any of his friends attention would be immediately directed to any ladies who might happen to be in my company so i shall not visit old burlington street this evening i cannot possibly remain many minutes interrupted rainford in fact i am going to leave england very shortly leave england ejaculated clarence i am truly sorry to hear that announcement just as we begin to get friendly together circumstances compel me to take this step answered rainford and my time for preparation is short i have called to-night upon business for in a word you can do me a service perhaps if you will as if there were any doubt relative to my inclination provided i have the power exclaimed clarence who was busily employed in decanting a bottle of port wine and then having placed upon the table two glasses which he filled he said you know captain sparks that i am under the greatest obligation to you through your kind your generous intervention adelaide's will be mine the bands were published at st george's hanover square a second time to-day and to-morrow week we shall be united the bridal breakfast will take place at my aunt's shall we not have the pleasure of your company pray do not refuse me it is impossible much as i should rejoice at being the witness of that union which no severe or mercenary father will be able to subvert said rainford in a feeling tone my affairs compel me to leave this country at least for a time and for that reason i am anxious to place in your hands a certain document the mystery of which some accident might probably lead you to clear up rainford then produced the letter which had been found upon the person of the deceased sarah watts and which he now requested villiers to peruse you observe that there is no address to indicate the name of the lady to whom that letter was written continued the highwayman when clarence had read it with attention the child to whom it refers is now in my care accident threw him in my way and his adoptive mother who was the writer of that letter is no more will the child accompany you asked villiers he will but i will write to you the moment i reach america to which country i am going and let you know my address or at all events through what channel a letter will come direct to me then should you have made any discovery which is however scarcely to be expected still as a wise precaution i have adopted this step you are right captain said villiers and i shall not forget the trust you have now confided to me should anything transpire respecting this matter i will not fail to communicate with you but will you not pass one evening with me in the society of my aunt and the two young ladies who will all be delighted to receive you mrs slingsby is a most amiable and excellent woman a little of a saint is she not exclaimed the highwayman dryly she is certainly of a religious turn of mind indeed i may say enthusiastically so answered villiers but she is extremely charitable and her benevolence embraces a very wide circle i believe she is a handsome woman too observed tom rain 
she is possessed of personal as well as mental attractions captain sparks responded villiers seriously but when in her society you would think of her only as the pious benevolent and compassionate woman whose heart is ever ready to sympathise with the woes of her fellow-creatures to speak candidly mr villiers said rainford i am no friend of the saints it may be a prejudice on my part but i can't help it excuse me for my frankness i beg of you to take it in good part still i always think that the stillest water runs deepest and i would not remember captain sparks interrupted villiers somewhat warmly that you are speaking of my aunt who is a most worthy and estimable woman deeply as i am indebted to you much as i am inclined to esteem you yet i understand you my dear villiers cried tom you cannot permit me to breathe even a suspicion against mrs slingsby in your presence well i know that it is most ungracious on my part still as i was more or less instrumental in introducing those two artless confiding young ladies to quit their father's home to abandon the paternal dwelling good heavens what do you mean ejaculated clarence now seriously alarmed i see that there is something at the bottom of all this captain sparks i implore you to explain yourself you are evidently well-intentioned you've shown the greatest friendship to me i reciprocate the feeling most cordially fear not then to speak my dear villiers answered the highwayman how can i enter upon particulars the narration of which will be most painful for you to hear and yet i should not be acting consistently with my duty towards those young ladies nor towards yourself who are about to make one of them your wife hesitate not speak freely exclaimed clarence seeing that his companion paused should the breath of scandal have wafted to your ear anything prejudicial to the character of my aunt i cannot blame your motive in confiding the fact to me and i the more earnestly solicit that you be frank and candid that is to act consistently with your nature which is all frankness and candour and reveal to me the cause of this distrust this want of confidence relative to mrs slingsby because i have no doubt of being able to convince you that you have been misled and should i succeed in convincing you to the contrary asked rainford then i should say that you have indeed performed the part of a friend replied villiers emphatically although i know beforehand that such a result is impossible yet for your complete satisfaction do i declare that should you prove my aunt to be in any way an unsuitable guardian for that dear girl adelais and her sister i shall conceive it to be my duty immediately to seek for them another home yes another home even for the few days that remain to be passed ere i shall acquire a right to protect adelais as her husband and rosamond as her brother you have spoken well and wisely villiers said rainford but i do not recommend any extreme measure which might only irritate your aunt and perhaps lead to the forced restoration of the young ladies to their father before you can have obtained the right you speak of i merely wish you to be on your guard but the grounds of your suspicion captain cried clarence impatiently pardon my interruption and pity my suspense i do both returned the highwayman and now remember that i am no mischief-maker between relations or friends and were it not for the peculiar circumstances of this case in which two innocent young ladies are concerned i should never have thought it worth while to utter a word of anything i know injurious to mrs slingsby's character no not even to unmask the most disgusting hypocrisy added rainford warmly do you still allude to my aunt demanded clarence colouring with indignation i do but start not i am not seeking a quarrel with you villiers and you promised to listen patiently to no other living being should i have listened so patiently as i have already done to you said clarence but pray let us hasten to dispose of so disagreeable a topic in one way or the other i am most anxious to do so continued the highwayman do you know sir henry courtenay certainly he is my aunt's best friend and her lover added rainford coolly villiers started from his seat exclaiming captain sparks you presume upon the obligation which i owe you to calumniate then good evening mr villiers interrupted the highwayman 
if this is the fair and impartial hearing which you promise to give me if this is the manner in which you treat one who has not cannot have an improper motive in offering you wise counsel stay my dear friend stay exclaimed clarence actively thrusting rainford back into his seat and pray forgive my impetuosity but this accusation so sudden so unexpected so very strange and yet it is substantially true added rainford emphatically and it is proper that you should know it for my part i am not the man to name mrs slingsby for having a lover nor yet the lover for having her as his mistress it's human nature both ways but when i know that she has been entrusted by you with the guardianship of two young ladies of tender age and spotless innocence and one of whom is so very very dear to you i consider it necessary for you to be enlightened as to her true character i have no doubt that you must feel deeply this communication but it is better for you to learn that your aunt is something that she ought not to be than to find out when it is too late that your wife or her sister have been corrupted by bad example clarence paced the room in an agitated manner and then at the expiration of a few minutes he turned suddenly exclaiming not for a moment captain sparks do i suspect you of any sinister object but you will pardon me for soliciting the proof of this charge which if substantiated must so completely and so painfully change my opinion of a relative whom i have until now vaunted as the pattern of virtue and propriety the mode of proving the charge may be left to yourself replied the highwayman did you ever hear the circumstances of your aunt's house being robbed by a boy to whom she gave a night's lodging some four or five years ago certainly exclaimed villiers i recollect the incident well mrs slingsby herself communicated it to me the ungrateful young villain i know that boy interrupted tom ray dryly and i am convinced that he told me the truth when he declared that during the night or rather the portion of the night which he passed in mrs slingsby's house accident made him a witness to a scene which leaves no doubt as to the fact that sir henry courtenay and mrs slingsby are as intimate as man and wife together and would you receive the testimony of a thief when well corroborated added the highwayman but how happened it that you should have any connection with this lad captain sparks demanded clarence in a cold and suspicious tone suppose that the boy has repented of his errors that he has merited my interest by a service which accident enabled him to render me that he related to me his entire history in which this incident is comprised and that on questioning him closely i learnt that the occurrence took place at the resident of your aunt i am bewildered amazed grieved profoundly grieved ejaculated villiers to suppose for an instant that this kind and affectionate relative who has always been so good to me and through whose bounty i am enabled to prepare and fit up a suitable dwelling for the reception of my beloved adelais to think that this much respected and long revered woman should conceal the greatest profligacy beneath the mask of charity and religion oh it is a cruel blow again i say that the mode of proving the charge may be left to yourself observed rainford seek an opportunity to be alone with mrs slingsby make some pointed allusion to the incident and mark how she receives it i will call at my aunt's residence to-morrow morning early the very first thing exclaimed villiers the whole affair is most serious and now that i can at length contemplate it with something bordering on calmness i am bound to confess but let us quit the topic he added in a tone of deep vexation in spite of his asserted self-possession and you bear me no ill will for the course i have pursued said rainford far from it you have acted in the most friendly manner whatever the results may be cried villiers grasping the highwayman's hand most cordially i have performed a very painful duty rejoined tom and now i must take my leave of you perhaps for a long long time if not for ever farewell said clarence and may prosperity attend you in another clime farewell replied rainford and may you be happy with your adelais the highwaymen then hurried from the room considerably affected by this parting 
from one for whom he already experienced a most sincere regard nor was villiers unmoved by this farewell scene for on his side he was particularly attached to the individual who had not only rendered him so essential a service on that memorable night which first made them acquainted with each other but whose apparent frankness of disposition and manliness of character were well calculated to engage the good opinion of the confiding warm-hearted and unsuspecting clarence End of section forty five recording by gray clayton section forty six of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gray clayton the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section forty six chapter forty five mr dykes and his myrmidons it was midnight and profound silence reigned throughout the region of locks fields but suddenly that silence was broken by the tread of several persons who emerged from a by alley in the immediate vicinity of brandon street they were six in number five men and a woman this is the street said the woman oh this is it mrs bunce eh returned mr dykes the bow street officer rubbing his nose with the knob of his stout ash stick while his countenance on which the bright moonbeams played showed an expression of calm determination yes that's the house there the ninth on to the side of the way added mrs bunce well now we don't want you no more ma'am said dykes cause women is all very well in their place and darling creatures they are too but when a grab is to be made they're best at home abed and asleep so good night to you ma'am good night gentlemen all responded mrs bunce and she hurried away now bingham and you fellows said mr dykes we must mind what we're up to for we shan't catch a weasel asleep you bingham take one of the runners and get round to the back of the house me and t'other chaps will make the entry in the front but we shan't stir a peg for one quarter of an hour and by that time you'll be at your post all right returned mr bingham and this individual accordingly moved off followed by one of the subordinate runners in the meantime tom rainford was sleeping not dreaming of danger in the arms of the beautiful jewess charlie watts was cradled in a little bed made up for him in the warmest corner of the room a light burned in the apartment where naught was heard save the slow regular breathing of the sleepers the clear transparent olive complexion of the beautiful jewess contrasted strongly with the florid countenance of the highwayman and the commingling of the raven hair of the one with the light almost yellow locks of the other produced a strange effect as the marked discrepancy of hues was set off by the snowy whiteness of the pillow by the feeble light of the candle it appeared as if ebony and gold were blending on a white ground but hark what is that sound which breaks on the silence of the chamber and wherefore does the highwayman start from his sleep he awakes and listens the jewess also awakes and also listens one of her beautifully modelled arms thrown around the neck of him whom she loved so fondly. "'Someone is trying the back door,' whispered Rainford at length, and he leapt from the bed. In less than a minute he had thrown on his clothes, and grasping his pistols he hastened to the window. But at the same instant the back door was forced in, more violently, no doubt, than Bingham and his co-operator had intended, and the sound was too unequivocal to permit tom rain to doubt the meaning of the disturbance returning to the bed he said in a hurried but solemn and deeply impressive tone dearest i am betrayed if i escape you shall soon hear from me if i am captured i charge you by all the love i bear for you by all the love you bear for me not to attempt to visit me in prison farewell dearest dearest girl he embraced her fondly affectionately oh most lovingly while she sobbed as if her heart would break 
and then in a moment he tore himself away footsteps many footsteps were already ascending nay rushing up the stairs he darted from the room sprang up a ladder which stood on the landing pushed up a trap door and in another moment was on the roof of the house the officers were close upon him dykes and his two men had effected an entry by the front door of the house almost at the same moment that bingham and his follower had broken in at the back and the entire posse reached the landing just at the moment that the trap door fell down heavily into place he's escaped by the roof cried dykes bingham me boy take a couple of chaps and watch the backs of the houses he can't get away by the front it's too high for him to leap into the street me and t'other chap will after him to the tilings thus saying dykes ascended the ladder as quickly as his unwieldy form would permit the trap door was easily raised as it only fastened inside and the portly body of the bow street officer who possessed more courage than alacrity was forced through the small aperture the operation was slow and difficult but at last mr dykes stood on the narrow ledge which ran along the whole row of houses and from which the roof rose obliquely behind this ledge was only protected by a parapet about two feet high and the officer felt his position to be anything but a safe one but he was not a man to shrink from danger come along you feller he cried out to his follower who speedily emerged from the opening you cut along that way and i'll go this and they proceeded in different directions on the roof of the house the moon shone brightly but tom rainford was not to be seen suddenly an exclamation of triumph burst from the yard at the back of one of the adjacent houses hello vociferated dykes from the eminence on which he stood we've got him fast enough returned bingham a piercing shriek from a window that had been thrown open denoted the anguish of the jewess whose ears had caught these words mr dykes and his attendant subordinate now retraced their way to the trap door through the aperture of which they once more forced themselves and when they had regained the landing dykes said now you go and join my partner bingham cause this rainford is a desperate fellow and the more there is to guard him the better the man accordingly took his departure and mr dykes knocked gently on the door of the bedroom who's there asked a voice within a voice soft and melodious but now expressive of the most intense anguish beg pardon ma'am said dykes but i must do my duty and if so be you'll have the kindness to dress yourself i should like to examine the boxes and cupboards and such like just for form's sake and that's all must you add to the grief which is already the plaintive voice was interrupted by a violent fit of sobbing with the mournful sounds of which the crying of the little boy now commingled i don't want to annoy you ma'am returned dykes i should hope not indeed exclaimed the landlady who having been alarmed by the disturbance had got up and dressed herself and was now ascending the stairs but what is it all about and why do you break into a respectable house in this way i don't suppose you're thieves or else i am an officer ma'am exclaimed dykes drawing himself up with offended dignity as the candle which the landlady carried in her hand lighted the landing-place i am an officer ma'am and my partners have just taken one thomas rainford a highwayman a highwayman ejaculated the widow who had never suspected the character of her lodger and who was a prudent woman that never troubled herself about other people's business so long as her rent was regularly paid yes a highwayman added dykes but i've no time to stand palavering i believe there's a lady in this room here and i must overhaul the place as the case is a serious one you'll do well to step in and let me do the job quietly i don't want to annoy her the law isn't at loggerheads with her and so she's nothing to fear as for me i'm as gentle as a lamb when a lady's concerned the widow urged the afflicted girl within the room to open the door and as the latter had by this time dressed herself the request was complied with but the jewess wore a deep black veil over her head when the officer and the landlady entered the bedchamber and taking charlie in her arms she seated herself in a chair near the bed whispering a few words of consolation to the little boy even amidst the terrible violence of her own grief 
as for charles he knew that something wrong was occurring but he was too young to comprehend the real nature of the appearances which terrified him dykes just opened a cupboard plunged his hands into a trunk and turned out the contents of a carpet bag but he did not prosecute his search any farther for he was too much experienced in the ways of robbers and rogues to suppose for a moment that he should find on the premises any portion of the money stolen from sir christopher blunt this being the charge on which rainford was arrested the search such as it was was merely for form's sake because the magistrate was sure to inquire whether the prisoner's lodgings had been carefully examined and this superficial glance at the contents of the boxes would enable mr dykes to give an affirmative answer without any very great deviation from the actual truth he accordingly quitted the room within a minute after entering it but he turned on the landing just to beg the dear young lady not to take on too much and also to assure the mistress of the house that she should be recompensed for the injury done to her abode by the violent entry effected by himself and his companions we must leave the landlady to console or endeavour to console the unhappy jewess and accompany mr dykes who passed out of the house by the back way and stepped over two or three low fences which separated the yards of the respective dwellings until he reached that one where tom rain was in the custody of bingham and the subordinate runners it appeared that the gallant highwayman finding how hotly he was pursued when he was escaping by means of the trap-door and dreading lest the whole neighbourhood should be alarmed ere he could possibly get away had resolved on the dangerous expedient of sliding down from the roof to the back of the buildings by means of the perpendicular leaden water-pipe but when he was half-way down in his perilous descent he missed his hold and fell upon the stone pavement of the yard beneath he endeavoured to get up and escape but could not his right ankle was sprained almost to dislocation and in a few moments he was discovered and captured by the detachment under the orders of bingham he heard the piercing scream which followed the announcement of his arrest by this officer and that scream oh it went to thy generous heart tom rain but he uttered not a word he offered no resistance although he had his pistols about him he not only shrank from the idea of shedding human blood but he was also well aware that his case was now too desperate to be benefited by even desperate means for even if he slew all the officers he could not drag himself away ere the neighbours would collect and capture him and by this time the whole line of houses was awake with bustle and excitement light after light appeared at the different casements windows were thrown up and the rumour spread like wildfire that a famous highwayman had just been arrested the reader may well conceive the nature of the sensation which now prevailed all along the back of brandon street but in one room there was a beauteous woman convulsed with torturing maddening anguish for deep was her love for thee tom rain now then cried dykes as he made his appearance in the yard where the highwayman was sitting on an inverted wash-tub surrounded by the runners to whom he had surrendered his pistols now then lads let's off with him to quad how do you do mr rainford don't want to crow over a gentleman in trouble but thought i should have you some day or another and then stooping down he whispered in tom's ear i was obliged to give a look in at the crib up there just now but i only stayed for a moment and shan't trouble the poor lady any more she had a veil over her face so i don't know who she is that is you see i shan't know if i'm asked any questions by the beak but of course i'm aware it's the handsome jewess who did the diamond business you are mistaken you are mistaken said rainford emphatically but if you showed her any civility i sincerely thank you lord bless you mr rainford i wouldn't do anything to annoy you for the world i can't help admiring a brave man and you're one the poor dear lady will be troubled no more by us and it's nothing to me who she is or who she is not the law don't want her at all events one word more said tom who has done this business for me a lawyer named howard was the answer but i can't say no more 
then what is the charge against me asked tom a considerable load already removed from his mind sir christopher blunt's little business that's all replied dykes but come along we must off to horsemonger mr dykes and mr bingham politely offered rainford their arms and the procession passed through the house in the yard belonging to which the capture had been made the occupants of that dwelling men women and children all in their night dresses crowded on the stairs to catch a glimpse of the terrible highwayman whose good-looking appearance excited the sympathy of the female portion of the spectators half an hour afterwards tom rain was lodged in a cell in the criminal department of horsemonger lane jail but his heart was lighter than the reader might possibly suppose for he was relieved of the first and most natural fear that assailed him namely that it was on account of benjamin bones's death that he was pursued if i must be hanged he thought with himself i would rather it should be for highway robbery than aught else but oh tamar tamar what is to become of thee and as he sat on the humble pallet in the darkness of his solitary cell he buried his face in his manacled hands in another moment a moonbeam penetrated through the barred window and in that silver ray glistened the tears which trickled between his fingers and yet it was not for himself he wept thou wast no coward but thou hast a generous heart tom rain end of section forty six recording by gray clayton